On March 20, 2019, the conference Perspectives for Sustainable Peace and Development in the Horn of Africa was held at the Vienna International Center. The conference was hosted by the Permanent Mission of Eritrea to the United Nations in cooperation with the Universal Peace Federation Austria and the United Nations Correspondence Association Vienna. I think it is important because the awareness in Europe and also in Austria is not adequate to the importance of the regions, not adequate to the importance uh, of the matters, the issues and the developments. And what we have to try is not only to look at it and to feel some developments, of course you always, everything that is new uh, brings turbulences. This is pretty clear. But you also have to look at it from the chances, from the opportunities, from the possibilities you have, from the challenges that bring some goods for yourself. And if I just take the whole of Africa state, named by Peter Heider, Ethiopia, Eritrea, Djibouti, Somalia, Sudan, South Sudan. Who is aware that only this area has more than 40% of the, of the area of the whole of Europe, the whole of European continent, and also the inhabitants. Only 200 million people are living over there, in those countries, which means around about 40% of what European Union is. And insofar, we also have to look at it as, not only as a market, but as a, uh, let me say, as a place of exchange of ideas, of developments, of what is going on. This region will open the Indian Ocean and the Indo-Pacific for the Europeans. Let's look at, uh, at this region from this point of view, and then we will be able to influence it. Of course, we also have to contribute. I myself, I had the privilege in the past, when there was this divorce between Sudan and South Sudan, to assist in this process, by inviting people, ministers from the north and the south. Mr. Sharif remembers very well. We went to Baden and we made conferences in Khartoum and in Addis Ababa and in Vienna and anywhere in order to discuss uh, the problems that came up. But what we can do is be a fair moderator, be a fair actor in a process that is important for Europe and for Africa. And insofar, I'm absolutely sure that the whole of Africa will be an important issue and a very important topic for the coming years. And I ask you to engage in the same way as we will try to do so. Thank you very much. Welcome and peace and blessings be upon you, dear viewers of Horn of Africa TV. This is the third program in the Somali edition. I'm your host, Mohammed Mahmoud, and today we're broadcasting from Germany and Austria. Today's program will be in English and German. We wanted to say thank you for the positive engagement from our audiences all around the world in the various platforms for their likes, shares, comments, and subscriptions. And to the Somali-speaking audience, Kusur Dua, the Horn of Africa TV, Dawud Yal, Wa Burnamish Ken Sidahad, or Somali Kusapson. Like, comment, and subscribe, Sara. As happy in please welcome my wife, Carolyn Mahmoud, the co host for today's show and Dr. Werner Faselabend. Oh. Today's topic is the relationship between Africa, especially the Horn of Africa and Western Europe. Welcome, uh, Dr. Werner Faselabend. Thank you for joining us today 
Uh, we're happy to have you as our guest on the Horn of Africa channel. I think most people who know you as an expert in European politics will know that you're one of the few politicians in Europe who cares about uh, issues of Africa in general and the Horn of Africa in particular. Uh, we're aware that not all of our viewers will be familiar with your story. Uh, so please, uh, could you give us uh, a, an overview of your career and interests or experience in Africa? Okay, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure also for me. Uh, and I want to welcome all the participants from all over the world, from Vienna. We had African temperatures uh, the last week. Uh, and insofar, I'm well prepared for this interview. Uh, yeah, just a few words to my own life and career. I was born in a small town uh, right at the border between Austria and Slovakia. Uh, when uh, I was born, this was still the end of uh, World War II. And maybe this also uh, was an event that shaped at least partly my life because I never knew my father because he died in the last days of the war. And insofar, uh, I'm more or less uh, somebody who learned very early, you know, also uh, the bad sides of life and the bad sides uh, that can be produced by politics. Okay, then I went to school, I studied, I studied in Vienna uh, languages and law. I also spent a year in the United States, and then I joined private industry, where I had a career as, uh, as product manager and as sales director of a big international company. Before uh, I came into politics, I became a member of the, the Austrian parliament and then minister in uh, 1990. And I was a defense minister for uh, almost 10 years uh, in a highly interesting period, the tra transition period after the end of the Cold War. Uh, and now I have been already for quite some time the president of the Austrian Institute for European and Security Policy. Uh, we are engaged in international politics, uh, you could say almost worldwide. Uh, and of course, Africa is a very important topic for us. Why? Because Africa is the immediate neighbor of Europe. And of course, due to my personal experience, you know, I have read already as a young guy very much about uh, African civilization and African history. Uh, and I always was highly interested in this relationship. Uh, I mean, there is such an immense variety uh, of cultures, of civilizations, and of topics so far, uh, you only can be uh, interested. And this also led me not only to many visits in African countries, but especially also to the occupation with Sudan and South Sudan, where I'm also the honorary president of uh, the associations in Austria that occupy themselves. And I had the privilege, you know, uh, especially to take part in many dialogues uh, in the face of division of South Sudan from Sudan. And uh, I guess we could contribute at least a little bit that this divorce became peaceful. Uh, even if afterwards there was an outbreak of of quite some fighting in South Sudan. This was foreseeable, but okay. Uh, at least between North and South, this could be shaped peacefully. And certainly uh, this was one major experience I also had. Uh, we had organized conferences in Khartoum and in Juba uh, and in Addis Abeba in many places in order uh, to prepare the situation. and. Uh, therefore, I do have a little experience in African-European relations. Thank you so much um, for that introduction. Um, and as you just mentioned, uh, and also from the archives uh, of the Horn of Africa channel, it's clear to see that you care and you encourage the initiatives uh, and activities of Africans in Austria, 
um, as you mentioned, you're the honorary president of the Sudanese Austrian Friendship Association. Uh, you also participated in the uh, Peace and Development Conference in March 2019, uh, which was held at the United Nations at the initiative of the permanent mission of the state of Eritrea to the United Nations organization in uh, Vienna. Uh, what caught our attention is your open support for the peace process between Eritrea and Ethiopia in 2019. Uh, we presented a clip from your lecture at the conference um, as an introduction to this dialogue. What were the key takeaways from this conference? Yeah, uh, this certainly was an important event and I really want to thank also Mr. Hampton, the representative of Somalia in, in Austria for his initiative and for his activities, uh, which he really did out from a private uh, concern on the one hand and interest on the other hand. And uh, it really was not only a very successful conference where many diplomats from so many countries came together, uh, but it was a dialogue on the one hand between African countries here in Europe, information for many Europeans who have, who know very little about Africa and the challenges, uh, but also the achievements uh, that have been reached already in Africa. And on the other hand, it also was an opportunity for African diplomats uh, here in Vienna to discuss about the uh, situation at home. And uh, insofar, I think it was a very important exchange of ideas. And I'm absolutely sure, and I, I'm sure we will come together, that we should repeat it uh, and in more or less uh, regular terms, we should try to organize similar events here in Vienna at the United Nations, because this can become an important instrument also for the connection between Austria and Africa, but also Europe and Africa, and even beyond through, uh, uh, through the fact that uh, Vienna uh, is also the seat for quite some international organizations. Yeah, I mean, as you just mentioned, you know, um, Austria um, and its uh, place in the world, uh, that's actually ties in very closely with uh, the question that I had in mind, which is that um, Austria is a relatively small country uh, compared with Germany, uh, France and Britain. However, it plays a major role in European politics and it's even considered a bridge uh, of communication between Western countries and the former Eastern Bloc countries. It's also home to the third largest United Nations office um, as, as well as uh, several other international uh, offices and organizations. This makes Austria a center for development and um, dialogue among countries of the world. Um, are Austrians aware of and proud of the power and influence of their country? I'm not sure whether they are uh, proud enough uh, and they're aware enough of the role the country still is playing in the world. Uh, you also have to consider, you know, that uh, around about 100 years ago, uh, Austria still was one of the great European powers. The Austro-Hungarian monarchy uh, was the second uh, largest country uh, within Europe and uh, also now uh, there's quite some function as you mentioned it already. Why? Because Austria is a pretty small country if you look at the size, uh, at the area uh, of the country, it only has 84,000 square kilometers. But we do have eight neighbors, eight neighbors and due to our central function within uh, Europe, also between the former Eastern and Western uh, side of Europe, of course, uh, Austria became a bridge. We have so many links to different civilizations, different ethnic and religious uh, groups also uh, due to our history. And this certainly makes us uh, very apt for international relations. And this also uh, one of the facts that we should use also for better connections between Europe uh, and, uh, and Africa. And maybe let me make uh, just a small comparison. 
you know, Austria does have this uh, function of a bridge due to its geostrategic situation in the middle uh, of Europe. And if I look now to the Horn of Africa, I would say, you know, the Horn of Africa has such an eminent strategic uh, function, not only for Africa, but for the whole world, uh, that people probably are underestimating uh, it completely. Why? I mean, the Horn of Africa is one side, uh, is the Western side of Africa. Uh, it is also the Western rim of the Indian Pacific and the Indo-Pacific Ocean uh, certainly has become and will become even more from day to day, the central maritime region of the world. Uh, in former times, it was the Mediterranean. And later on, it was the Atlantic Ocean, more or less the central maritime regions of the world. And now this uh, situation has changed. And in the 21st century, uh, the Indo-Pacific will be the central uh, geostrategic area of the world. And if you look, you know, to the long borders you have uh, in Eritrea and in Somalia, uh, thousands of kilometers of borderline, you know, uh, on the one hand, neighboring the Red Sea, and on the other hand, the open ocean, uh, the Indian Ocean, so far you really can uh, expect that there will be quite some development. And this is maybe something that Europeans still underestimate. Uh, before we re restart, I have to excuse myself because, you know, uh, I chose a wrong expression when I talked uh, about Mr. Hunton. Of course, he is the rep representative of Eritrea. Uh, obviously, I, I uh, mentioned another country. I'm very sorry about that. I always knew him just as the representative of uh, Eritrea. And insofar, uh, I beg your pardon for this misunderstanding. <laughs> well, it happens. <laughs> Um, so, as we were saying uh, before, um, there are those who say that there's uh, no relationship uh, between Africa and Europe. Uh, and on the other hand, there are those who say there is a relationship between Africa and Europe, uh, but in some ways it's an unfair or unequal relationship. Um, what is your assessment of the African-European relations? Yeah, uh, certainly you have to look uh, at it from different point of views, you know. Uh, I mean, if you look back to history, uh, even in immediately after World War One, uh, after World War Two, you know, when when I entered school, most African states still were uh, colonies of European states, whether this was Great Britain uh, or France or, or Belgium or uh, Portugal and Spain and others. Okay. Uh, and then there was this wave of independence. And certainly this was a, this not only a decisive movement, but it also uh, brought uh, a completely new development into the continent. And if we look now at it, you know, we still are more or less on the one hand captured by history. And on the other hand, uh, we are in the status of looking forward and having left history behind us. And what I see is, you know, uh, the most important phenomenon certainly is uh, the demographic development. When I went to school, Europe had two and a half to three times uh, more uh, population than the whole African continent. Now, you know, but Europe more or less stayed the same. And Africa has doubled the size of Europe, uh, if you look to the po population. And in 2050, uh, it will be three and a half or four times as many people living in Africa. Uh, and at the end of the century, once again, uh, probably the size will double. And what does it, does it mean? It means that the demographic uh, dynamic, of course, will shape not only 
the African continent, it's a huge challenge, of course. I mean, if you have to produce so many jobs for so many young people, you know, uh, you have so many young nations. But on the other hand, this also means that there will be quite some economic development, some political development. And this is uh, what we have to look at, because of course, uh, Africa also will need uh, assistance, help from European side. On the other hand, its own dynamic is so big, is so great, you know, that it will shape not only its own fate, but also the fate of the neighborhood. Probably at least in, in the 22nd century, Africa will be the most dynamic region of the world. And insofar, it's so important now to look at it and also to find out what can we do, what do we have to do, and what, uh, I mean, if uh, I would like to characterize this from the European side, I would say uh, what we need is much, much more efficiency in our uh, common work, in our cooperation between Europe and Africa. I mean, if I look, you know, uh, how efficient China is doing sometimes uh, some business. I'm not always, uh, I'm not always very fond about it because there's too much uh, business of its own interest. And of course, if we look to this huge African continent, a huge population, uh, we need programs that are interested foremost in the African development, in the African interest. And this is what we should try to do, you know. But what we certainly have to do is, you know, get rid of the old uh, ways of, of development, development policy. This did not work out, not really, you know. Uh, and to shape a new uh, cooperation policy between uh, Europe and Africa that is by far more efficient, that goes into the infrastructure in the interest of African states, that tries uh, to shape this African capital. And African capital is not only raw material, it's, it's also human capital uh, due to this young generation that is growing over there. And uh, therefore we have to concentrate on these subjects much, much more uh, than we did in the past. And I hope uh, also with our activities, we can contribute a little bit uh, to this development. I certainly hope so too. <laughs> um, uh, you touched on, on, on something. Um, you touched, touched on the history a little bit. Um, and it's, it's no secret that uh, historically, the relationship uh, between Europe and Africa was largely unfair from the transatlantic slave trade through the Berlin Conference, uh, which formalized the scramble for Africa uh, and industrialized the colonization of Africa through divide and conquer tactics by European nations, the effect of which are still felt uh, by Africans to this day. Uh, in more recent decades, there have been post-colonial interventions, including proxy wars, uh, sanctions against African countries, illegal arms sales, and unfair trade agreements. Um, the world seems to be shifting, though, uh, to a more open and honest dialogue about these issues. For example, Germany acknowledging the Namibian genocide in May 2021. And um, the question is, do you think it's a, positive, uh, it's a positive step in the right direction that will lead to healing? Uh, or is it opening old wounds and causing further uh, friction or conflicts? Uh, I think maybe it's both, you know. On the one hand, of course, it is necessary that the European uh, nations uh, do not deny the bad things of history, but uh, talk very open and very clearly about it. This is the one thing. The other one is that, of course, we should, in our relationship, not concentrate uh, on the faults and the mistakes of the past. Uh, we, should, we should try to handle them. And on the other hand, uh, think forward into the future. Uh, what do I mean? Uh, there's also a little bit of danger for some African countries or people, you know, uh, to think too much about the mistakes of the past and not uh, take it sometimes as a little bit of an excuse 
for uh, the lack of own activities. That's what I see. And then so far, we should try uh, to take this situation, talk about it, also take out consequences, financial consequences, as the Germans are doing uh, in Namibia, of course, uh, and try to make real projects out of it, not just, you know, for old debts or whatever, uh, and old obligations, but try to establish new ways of cooperation. That's what I see. Of course, uh, also, if you look to the Horn of Africa, you know, uh, it's quite interesting, uh, especially if you uh, look to the case of Somalia, you know, uh, you still have more or less the consequences that part of uh, Somalia was governed by the Italians and some other parts by the British. And uh, you can see it now also with the political development, Somaliland uh, as an autonomous, uh, more or less almost independent uh, unit uh, within the state of Somalia. Yeah? Uh, this certainly is a consequence out of history, you know, because you had two systems uh, with two ways of administration, of governance and so on. And of course, uh, you still feel it. On the other hand, uh, you now have to try to take the consequences out of the situation and try to go forward, what can we do? And what I think is, you know, that it certainly will be necessary uh, also to, to uh, strengthen, to increase uh, the quality of governance in most African countries. There are quite some differences uh, if, if you look at that. There are positive surprises and you will find negative surprises. And what I see, for example, is, you know, uh, for the Horn of Africa, uh, I see this geostrategic situation, as I have said, in a very critical point, uh, not only from the maritime side, but if you just look you know, to uh, the situation, also Somalia in between, on the one hand, Ethiopia, and on the other hand, Kenya. You know, Kenya is a very positive uh, example for development due to some circ circumstances. And if you look uh, to it, Ethiopia, you know, what a challenge. If you look to the ethnic uh, questions you can find there and how difficult it is to master all those uh, challenges. And what I have to say that uh, in, uh, as you can follow it very easily, you know, uh, the situation within the region, namely the cooperation between Eritrea and Ethiopia and Somalia will be probably the most important factor the most important factor, what you can produce, what you can do within the region. And only afterwards, there will be the consequences what comes from outside. But uh, what I see that due to this imminent strategic situation, there will be more chances in the future than in the past. That's what I see. And that's what I hope that we can get out some profit for the region out of this geostrategic situation. I hope so too. Um, you mentioned uh, the, um, uh, the, the balkanization uh, of Somalia as a result of, uh, partially uh, or, or largely as a result of the divide and conquer tactics of uh, Britain and Italy. There's another part to that equation. Um, there's also um, the occupation or colonization of Djibouti, which is a, a mixture of, of Somali <coughs> and a far <coughs> of Ethiopia um, or Eritrea, I'm not sure. Um, and there's also the balkanization within uh, these uh, semi-autonomous regions. Um, so there's the Ogaden region, which is still contested between Somalia and Ethiopia. Um, and there's also the northern uh, part of Kenya uh, now, uh, which is contested by Somalia since the 90% of the population or more is, is Somali. Um, but there's also the balkanization within these semi-autonomous regions. For example, within Somaliland itself, um, there are um, uh, groups of people or tribes 
that have nothing to do with Somaliland and want to be part of mainland Somalia um, or their own separate <laughs> semi-state. Um, that's on the west you have the Odo state and uh, on the on the east you have the Makir state and uh, I think uh, uh, there's another another state too. So even within these uh, semi-autonomous uh, uh, regional uh, tribal governments, uh, there's there's division. Um, but as you said, we can look to the future and see maybe a positive. And that brings us on to the next uh, topic, uh, which is that Africa has so much to offer the world, um, including abundant, untapped natural resources. Unfortunately, for most African countries, the business relationship is limited to purchase of European products. Uh, China's Belt and Road Initiative is by comparison uh, extremely attractive to many African nations. Um, and European nations now see China as a threat to their presence in Africa. And as you mentioned, um, a lot of the time, it is a, a self-interested uh, uh, move by China. Um, the new generation of Africans, uh, both in Africa and uh, in the diaspora, are beginning to cooperate together and see the value of what they have in their home countries. So they're building Africa from the ground up because the top-down approach, as you said, does not seem to be working. Um, this has seen several African nations completely uh, bypassing incremental technological development. So since I'm familiar with Somalia, uh, I'm gonna use Somalia as an example. Uh, within Somalia, industries such as renewable energy, uh, telecommunications and electronic finance have gone from low tech to cutting edge in one big step. Um, there was even a term uh, coined to describe the phenomenon. It's called leapfrogging. <laughs> uh, this along with various uh, demographic factors led many analysts to point to Africa as the new frontier for economic growth. In contrast, uh, Europe seems to be stagnating and in some ways declining. With the looming uh, crisis exacerbated uh, by COVID and the closing of small businesses, various political crises, uh, such as the disintegration of the EU uh, and related treaties are leading to tensions. Um, for example, uh, the North Sea fishing rights, uh, among other things. We even saw Britain and France almost starting a naval war over fish uh, quite recently. Uh, while in Somalia, uh, the country with the longest coast in Africa with over 3,300 kilometers of coastline, uh, a country which is expected to be a blue, uh, blue, uh, blue economy giant, meaning the fishing and marine industry in Somalia will be the largest in Africa. There are tens of thousands of tons of fresh organic fish that are going to waste every year. That's just one example, uh, but it all comes down to this. Europe has a demand. Africa has a massive supply that's either going to waste or being exploited unfairly. Are European uh, nations ignoring these obvious solutions to their problems, or are the policymakers and investors completely unaware of Africa as a potential solution to their problems? Yeah. Uh, you mentioned Djibouti, and I think this is a perfect signal for the importance of the whole Horn of Africa. Uh, in this more or less tiny piece of land, you know, you now have uh, military bases for the, of the Americans, of the Chinese, of the French, not very far from it, also from the Russians. And this shows already uh, very clearly, you know, the political uh, importance and importance for global security uh, of the whole uh, Horn of Africa region for the future. Uh, why is there a competition between China and, and, uh, and uh, Europe in some parts uh, concerning the infrastructure? I used to say the Europeans do have to learn from the Chinese uh, that they are sometimes much more realistic and that they are successful in shaping some infrastructure. What I do not like so much is, you know, that the shaping of African infrastructure in many times is in the foremost interest uh, of Chinese politics or Chinese business. And the biggest danger for Africa that I see is that it just becomes more or less the point of delivery of raw materials for other industrialized countries. 
Africa has to leave this uh, position. Africa has to create its own uh, production. It has to develop uh, its economy uh, in order to provide enough goods for its own uh, people, for its own population. That's what I see. You know? And uh, looking also to the fact that uh, sometimes the loans that are given by Chinese uh, government or uh, companies uh, do have a negative effect. I can tell you, on the one hand, you know it probably, this Sri Lankan uh, example, uh, where the Chinese more or less built huge infrastructure for uh, the harbor, uh, but they could not repay the loans, uh, the Sri Lankan government, and therefore they had uh, to give the port for 99 years to the Chinese. And now we have similar examples also in Europe at the Balkans in Montenegro, where they constructed uh, a big highway, you know, uh, huge highway, not necessary uh, for the Montenegrins, much more in the interest of the Chinese. And now the, uh, the Montenegrin government is not capable to repay the loans for it uh, and ask the European Union to do it. <laughs> this is not the solution, you know. So far, I think, you know, all these projects should be developed foremost in the interest uh, of uh, African countries. What is necessary to develop African infrastructure? What is necessary to build up African industrial capabilities? And what I see is this huge human capital. What I learned, you know, is that there are so many so highly intelligent people in Africa uh, that really are looking for jobs that are for uh, an opportunity to show what uh, they are able to do and, and so on. And this is what I see much more, you know, uh, what Europe should do. Uh, Europe spent by far the most development aid uh, from, from the whole globe, I, I think, uh, most of the development aid was paid by European countries. But if you look to the effect, this is not enough because they invested by far too much into NGOs, into just uh, social uh, programs that help for the moment. But what Africa needs is not the help for the moment. It is a, a, a big program for the future, you know, for its own development, to strengthen its own capabilities. And this is what I see what Europe has to learn, uh, to be much, much more efficient, to go into uh, realistic programs. And uh, what I see is the chance that the Europeans, probably also due to uh, the mistakes they have made uh, in the history, they will do it much more in the interest of African countries uh, in order, uh, well, as a sort of compensation for, for historic uh, faults. And on the other hand also, uh, because they are interested also to keep uh, African people, of course, in their home countries, because uh, Europe never will be able to overtake, I don't know, uh, millions and millions and millions of African young people who do not find a job in their home country and therefore will go uh, to Europe. And insofar, this is also in European interest, you know, that uh, an industry, an African industry, can be built up for the future. Uh, what we have to find is good ways. Uh, there's always one problem, you know, uh, also the efficiency from both sides has to be improved. That's what I see. I mean, it's it's actually 100% accurate. Um, this is not, um, uh, this is actually not part of the, the, the main show, but um, my wife and I, we're, we're entrepreneurs and uh, we've met with various uh, uh, investors here in Europe um, and technology companies. And 
the biggest challenge. So they're always interested when you talk about uh, uh, the project, because the thing is, a lot of these big infrastructure companies, they don't have much to do in Europe anymore. Whereas in Europe and in, in Africa, there is a lot of opportunity for them to, to expand and grow uh, their, their access to a whole new market. Um, so they're interested by the idea, by the concept. But the moment you mention Africa, at the moment you start talking about Somalia, there's a lot of misconception and they don't seem to understand that uh, it's, it's changing. There's a lot, it's a lot more peaceful, um, that there's a, a, a young, educated um, generation that's raising up both in the diaspora and uh, in Africa who want to work, who don't want handouts, you know, who don't want uh, NGO uh, food or anything like this. They want a job. They want a career. They want an industry and an infrastructure. And so that's that's what the, the question was around. Yeah. Uh, I mean, certainly... It will be necessary, you know, therefore, from the African side to provide uh, political stability in their own countries, because always stability is the precondition uh, for investment. Yeah. Uh, every entrepreneur only will invest his good money uh, if he has a good chance, you know, to get more out of it uh, as what he is investing. And therefore, uh, if the situation is very unstable and very insecure, whether he can at least get back his money that he is investing, he will not try to invest at all. No. Uh, therefore, no. stability is a precondition. And on the other hand, you know, you need this precondition for economic development and economic development is also the precondition for political stability. I mean, if the young people have a job, they will not demonstrate against the government, you know? Uh, they will do th their job and try to earn some money. And insofar, political stability is also dependent on the economic uh, development. And this means also uh, that there is more or less a circle, you know, of stability, economic development, political stability, and the readiness for new investments uh, uh, that should go on for the future. And this is what we have to reach, you know. Therefore, it's not just one component, but it's more or less an overall situation we have to shape, and we only can shape it together. Uh, I mean, the, the African people cannot do it just by themselves because there's not enough capital uh, within the countries and so on, uh, but they can try to create situations of inner stability. And then of course the investments will come and this is uh, the shaping of a common situation that also should be done in a common way together by Africans uh, and Europeans. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting that you mentioned security because uh, I don't know, uh, you may be aware that uh, in the next few days, uh, the peace agreement between Somalia, Eritrea and Ethiopia will enter its third year. Um, so my question is, uh, what is your assessment of the situation in the region after the signing of, of this peace agreement? Yeah, uh, I think, you know, this was a major step in African politics. Why? I mean, uh, you have to be aware uh, the separation, the divorce, as I uh, called it, you know, from South Sudan, uh, from, from the North, from Sudan, uh, shaping an own state, was the first step in this direction uh, within a, an African country. Not absolutely, because before uh, there was already the divorce between the Eritrean state from uh, Ethiopia in the past. But the difference, the big difference was that this happened by the free will. It was uh, just, you know, they shaped the state together by free will. And when they saw it did not work out, they also tried to go into independence. Therefore, uh, the independence movement of Eritrea was different, of course, uh, to the question of South Sudan. And the most important thing that I see is that this did not bring a situation of separation between uh, 
uh, between the two states and, and the nations, uh, but went into a new phase of cooperation. That's what I see. And if you look to the ethnic situation, you mentioned it already, you know, Somali people living in Somalia, in Somaliland, in, in Djibouti, uh, in Ethiopia, in the north of Kenya and so on, uh, you only will be able, you know, uh, to have a peaceful si uh, situation and stability within the region if you cooperate. If you do, do not think that uh, the, the country borders you have also should be borders for the people because there are no ethnic borders uh, in, in, in the same uh, in the same line as you find them on the political uh, on the political map, and therefore I think this was so important, such an important step, the, the readiness of the Eritrean government uh, to cooperate uh, with Ethiopia and vice versa, you know, and of course also uh, taking Somalia or bringing Somalia into uh, this overall situation, because if you have to look at the situation, you always have to be aware. It's not one single country that will change uh, the, the life for the people. You have to look at the region as a whole. And as I said, you know, this eminent strategic importance of the region more or less forces uh, also politicians from different sides to do it. And insofar, I'm very glad, I'm really happy that this happened and this is one of the big achievements of the three governments in the three states. Excellent. Um, our last question. Um, so Somalia has gone through a difficult stage in the last uh, 30 years because of uh, conflict and war, um, some of which was externally influenced, others due to internal differences. Unfortunately, uh, Somalia has not preserved its constitutional institutions and is now taking firm steps to rebuild uh, what was destroyed by the war. It's heading towards peace and reconstruction. There are more and more areas uh, within Somalia that are now becoming uh, peaceful and are peaceful. Um, what do you advise Somalia and the Somali people to complete this transition to peace? And what do you advise the West in its relation with Somalia and the Somali people? I'm sure that Somali people uh, not, are not only fond about uh, peace and stability, but they really want it because this is their life, you know? And you only can do your business, whether this is agriculture uh, or industry or tourism or administration or whatever, you know, services in any kind, you only can do it if there is peace and stability, as I mentioned already. Uh, and therefore, what I see, you know, in Somalia, certainly the foremost challenge is uh, to broaden the region of peace and stability with every day, more or less, you know. Uh, and as I uh, tried to, to uh, say already, you know, also this geostrategic situation, the entrance to the Red Sea. On the other hand also, uh, because most of the maritime traffic follows not too far away from the coastlines, you know, it's also this crossing point of uh, Eastern Asian, Southern Asian, Southeast Asian uh, ways to Europe and to the African continent, uh, to the north and to the south. This certainly uh, is such an important situation that you have to try to make the best out of it. And you will see there will be chances for the future. You mentioned already, you know, this fishing capabilities. And uh, if you just look to the situation that more than 3,000 kilometers of borderline uh, are bringing, of course, excellent uh, opportunities for the, for the future and the development uh, of, of fish and fish certainly will become more and more important also for the future. This is one thing. As I mentioned already also, if you look to 
um, good development in Kenya, for example, you know, and also for uh, um, the development you have found in the north. Uh, in so far, you you can expect if there's peace and stability, this will be uh, a region of fast development. I'm pretty sure about that. And if the Europeans can contribute also to the inner stability, uh, and sometimes, you know, it's good when somebody from outside uh, tries to bring people together uh, who do have different positions. You know, this sometimes is easier from outside than from inside. From inside, you always have, uh, well, uh, the same, the same uh, challenges from the past, and you are thinking, uh, what has happened in the past and so on. But we have to look to the future and sometimes this is easier from outside. And insofar, I think uh, that Europe should contribute uh, not only uh, a little, but more than it did in the past to this process, ongoing process uh, in Somalia, but also the ongoing process uh, in Eritrea. Uh, of course, the countries do have Different, different conditions uh, as most countries in, in Europe. And if you can see also in Ethiopia uh, with uh, the Tigray uh, region now, there are inner problems, inner challenges in almost every country. Try to overcome it, try to cooperate beyond the borders and you will strengthen the region and you will shape more or less the basis for a good future. I think so too. Um, thank you so much. Um, and I think now it's time for the German half of the show.